أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته everyone uh, welcome uh, really uh, welcome you all first of all a Ramadan Mubarak here in the UK uh, this Monday is Ramadan for many in many Muslim communities and um, we uh, make dua that Allah Ta'ala accepts all of our works this Ramadan, all of our prayers, and um, brings relief and comfort and well-being, afia to all Muslims uh, all around the world. I'm um, honored to welcome you to this uh, Ramadan 24 Understand the Quran session from Cambridge Muslim College. And uh, as an independent institute of higher education and a registered charity, the growth and success of Cambridge Muslim College uh, rely on the generosity of our friends, patrons, and supporters from across the UK and beyond. And we have a wonderful um, support in the UK, and uh, we also have a wonderful support in the, beyond the UK internationally as well. Uh, help Cambridge Muslim College train future generations of Muslim scholars, thinkers, and leaders, and continue delivering educational programs like Ramadan Live. You can help us continue our vital work through regular giving, become a friend or patron of the college today through one-off donations, whatever the amount, or you can also pay your zakat to the college directly benefiting students in need. Please visit cambridgemuslimcollege.ac.uk forward slash donate and donate today. Hey, Bismillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Shahru Ramadan al-Ladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, huda lil-Nazi wa bayyinatim min al-Huda wal-Furqan. And Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was first sent down, a supreme comprehensive guide to mankind and surpassing clear proofs of guidance vindicating it and by its comprising the sole final criteria. No doubt this is the month of the Qur'an where Allah Ta'ala, after introducing this month, identifies one of its salient qualities and features, that being the month which the Qur'an was sent down, unzila fihi al-Qur'an. And this Qur'an has been described as a hudan lidna, as a supreme comprehensive guide to all of mankind. And expressing the clarity of the Qur'an and its proofs that it is the truth and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala cl clarifies saying, and surpassing clear proofs of guidance, vindicating it, and by its comprising the sole final criteria. No doubt this is a time where Muslims turn to the Qur'an and recite it and have a strong relationship and renew our relationship to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we do so in many different ways. Um, what we like to, I would like to share in these this session and in our future sessions, are the what's called the maqasid of the Quran, the ultimate aims which the Quran aims at. In other words, um, wants uh, wants all of us who are reading the Quran to go to. Um, the Quran has taken us to a place and it asks us to go to that place. What is that place? Where are we headed? What's our direction? And how do we get there? All of these illuminate the true nature of the Quran when we look at the maqasid or the aims of the Quran. Um, as we start, uh, you know, I would like to share a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which uh, as a guiding hadith throughout uh, for us in this month. In the Sahih Muslim, it's reported that the Prophet says, Inna dina and nasiha, that religion is nasiha. Nasiha has this idea of sincere, true counsel, that we give true counsel to, uh, it's, it's giving true and sincere counsel is the basis of this religion. And he said this three times, Inna dina nasiha, Inna dina nasiha tu, Inna dina and nasiha tu. And the qalu liman ya Rasulullah, that was the reply of the companions. To whom is this sincere counsel uh, to be directed at? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, qal lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li nabihi wa li a'immat al-mu'mineen wa ammatihim. 
when the Prophet ﷺ responded saying to God, to his book, his messenger, the leaders of the Muslims, and their common folk. And so what I wanted to focus on in this very comprehensive hadith, which many scholars have dedicated separate uh, books on the commentary uh, on this hadith. A notable one is by Sheikh Ahmed Zarruq, uh, radiallahu anhu. Um, but here we all wanted to focus on what does it mean to be sincere and uh, true to God's book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book, the Quran. And here the ulama have uh, explained this in many different ways. But what they said here is that having sincerity regarding the book of Allah is believing that it is the speech of God Most High. So if we want to be true and be sincere to Allah's book, this is what it entails on, on each and every one of us, is that we believe that it is the speech of God Most High and His revelation. So we have to understand and believe the true nature of this book. It's not just a piece of literature that was somehow inspired like, you know, poets are inspired with their poetry. No, this is a speech of God, and this is truly the case. And we believe in that it is the speech of God, Most High, and His revelation. Being sincere, having nasiha to His book also, indicate, also entails that we believe that this book does not resemble anything from the words of people. Right? And so this idea of kind of treating it as a book of literature and analyzing and uh, studying the book as if it's a piece of literature to, inspired to a human being or created by a human being. That's not what this, that doesn't, and the, being true to this book contradicts that and excludes that type of attitude because it's not, it's, it, that, that's not the case. It is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, nasiha entails that people uh, believing that people are incapable of anything like it, even if they all join together to attempt to create a book like the Qur'an. Sincerity is also to extol the glory of the Qur'an, to recite it and give its recitation its just due, beautifying it, being humble while doing so, and correctly pronouncing its letters. Scholars continue to say that, and this is from Imam Nawawi's book, It to be Anfi Adabi Hamlet Qur'an, that Nasiha true being true to the Quran is defending it from the misinterpretations of the deviators. Right? So many individuals would misinterpret the Quran and use the Quran to serve their own deviant and or heretical doctrines or beliefs or agendas that they have. So part of being true to the Quran is to defend it from those misinterpretations of the deviators and the opposition of the tyrants believing in everything it, that it contains and not exceeding its boundaries. And it further entails that one uh, understands its knowledge and the examples given in the Qur'an. It is paying attention to its exhortations, pondering its amazing wonders, acting according to what has unequivocal meaning and submitting to what is open to interpretation. Searching out its universals, and restricted rulings, its abrogating and abrogated passages, and propagating its sciences. And finally, calling others to them and to all the sincere counsel that we have mentioned. So this is what a nasiha entails to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as explained by our scholars. And it's hoped that in this month, this series, inshallah, that CMC has uh, dedicated with this wonderful team of, of people who work at this college endlessly and very uh, passionately, this Understand the uh, Understand the Quran series is inshallah will contribute and will count amongst all of us as being some form of nasiha and being true to the Quran. So when we look at the, um, you know, when we look at the Quran, and to understand part of what this Qur'an is, is the, a very interesting thing here, is that the Qur'an has been described by many of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, in particular, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, 
he in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba and very other, you know, various other collections of hadith and sayings of the companions of the law on whom he Abdullah bin Masood is reported to have said, Inna had al Quran ma'dubatullah, faman dakhala fihi fahu aminun. That this Quran, in the Hadr Quran, this very Quran is the Ma'duba, Ma'duba to Allah. Ma'duba here is this idea of a banquet, right? Um, so this is, the Quran is the banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a banquet that everyone is invited towards, right? And uh, the Abdullah bin Masood continued to say, فَمَنْ دَخَلَ فِيهِ Whoever enters into this banquet and accepts this invitation, and comes with the proper adab, فَهُوَ aminun, And this person is safe, and will be safe from all the types of harm, and all types of um, undesirous ends in their life. And so, the Qur'an is the banquet of Allah, and we hope that this month, inshallah, we enjoy the banquet of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, through various different ways. And... This is the beauty of the Quran is that there's various different ways people have a relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. Um, and there's many different ways which we recite the Quran. Many of us have a what's called a devotional reading of the Quran, in which we read, for example, Surah Yasin in the morning in a devotional sense. We read Surah Al Mulk in the evening, Surah Al Waqiyah before we go to bed. Other times we would recite Surah Al Kahf. Um, on Fridays and Thursday nights and Fridays, mm -hmm. right? When a Surah Yasin, we'll recite them on someone who's on their on, on the verge of passing away. So we have these devotional readings of the Quran, which are beautiful and have a strong connection to the Quran and uh, indicate that we do have a strong connection to the Quran. There are other ayahs that we recite, you know, at, on certain times. But we also have what's called a contemplative recitation of the Quran. And here, this is um, embodied by uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where in a hadith that's uh, where it's mentioned, the companion said, Sallallahu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laylatan, that one night the Prophet Sallallahu was praying, فَقَرَأَ بِآيَةٍ And then he, in this whole night in which he was praying, he read one verse, hatta, uh, until he, in the morning time came, until he entered into the morning. Uh, and the verse that the Prophet recited the whole night. If you punish them, they are but your own slaves. And should you forgive them, verily you alone are the invincibly powerful, the supremely wise, the supremely wise. And then his companion said that when, when the morning time arrived, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ma zilta taqra hadihi al-aya. He goes, you continue to recite this one verse. Hatta, hatta asbahta tarka'u biha wa tasjudu biha. Until you entered into the morning, you were, you, know, you were performing, you were bowing and you were prostrating on this verse. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, Inni sa'altu, sa'altu rabbi ash-shafa'ata li ummati. Because I I asked my Lord of the great intercession for my entire community. And my Lord gave it to me. He granted me my request. And it will come about and be uh, acquired by the will of Allah for those who do not associate uh, when they uh, in uh, uh, any other kosher with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their worship or anything like this. So this is a very interesting example here of a further relationship where you're reciting one verse and you're contemplating over it as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has done here and uh, repeating it over and over again. And then people will have various spiritual openings uh, if Allah ta'ala decides and wishes to grant those openings to somebody here. And so from this contemplative recitation and this deep pondering over the Qur'an, various scholars have developed what's called, uh, through their own insights, the, the maqasid of the Qur'an. Here I translate maqasid as the aims of the Qur'an. It's something that it's uh, a maqasid, is 
something that's intended by the Qur'an. And these are the higher aims of the Qur'an. The aims are of different degrees or different levels. You can have aims of, uh, uh, of particular parts of surahs. You can have aims of entire surahs, right? Then you can have aims of different parts of the Qur'an. But then you have an ultimate uh, and the higher aims of the Qur'an as a whole, as, a, as one unity. And this is where the scholars looked at the Qur'an on various different levels as one whole unit, looking at various surahs together, looking at various ayahs separately as well. But then also many scholars maintain that there's an inherent uh, link and uh, uh, of between one ayah, every single ayah, and one ayah and the next, until you, know, you can see the Qur'an as a whole, uh, as a complete whole. And so from that, they look at, they develop this idea, these, uh, and they've had various different iterations of the, uh, of, of an inductive understanding of the various ayahs and surahs of the Quran and the Quran as a whole. And then they arrived at this understanding of that the Quran has maqasid or aims, higher aims. And what these aims do is very similar to the maqasid of the Sharia, where these aims will now uh, serve to provide order to the entire Qur'an, right? And that's something very important to keep in mind. Many Westerners, uh, when they look at the Qur'an, um, a common observation they make is that the Qur'an is very, what they call, disorganized, right? If you look at the first chapter, it doesn't start at the beginning, so to speak, of creation or the beginning of any particular uh, episode in history or, or the birth of an individual or the creation of the universe. And as you know, and so, and it doesn't follow a historical or chronological order of things. Rather, the Quran is a very different type of book. And it's in some ways, um, you know, it's, it's produced these type of, is resulted in certain people understanding or uh, concluding that the Quran is, it doesn't have an order. It doesn't make sense, right? The way we would normally do in perhaps some linear manner. And um, so, uh, in fact, the Quran does have an order, as these many of our scholars have identified. And it's these aims of the Quran that once they're understood, one is able to understand the entire Quran and its order. And one is able to place all the verses and understand what they're aiming at, the higher aim of these verses. And so we see, uh, this is an important thing, and, and it's really interesting that despite this, you know, apparent disorganized nature of the Quran, uh, many people, uh, especially, you know, recently have been um, attracted to the reading the Quran, opening the book up and, and, and just reading what it's about and reading it in the English language or other languages, but in particular, you know, in light of the recent events in Gaza, many people are trying to understand what the Palestinian faith's about. And so what they would do is open up the Quran and start reading it. And we hear of many stories of people converting to the Quran. And so this apparent lack of order um, seems to kind of go away. And the Quran is a different book in that sense. And, you know, one has to come to the Quran on, one, on the Quran's own terms. And part of the fruits of our, you know, uh, contemplative readings of the Quran of our scholars is this idea of the maqasid of the Quran. And one finds, for example, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, one of the great um, scholars uh, from Andalusia, in passed his away in 1340. He actually passed away as a martyr. Um, he died in 741 Hijra or 1340. He, in his work on Tafsir at Tashili Ulum at Tanzil identifies what he considers, you know, his his iteration of the aims of the Quran. And he says, Fa'alam an al Maqsuda bil Quran, Dawatul Khalki ila Ibadatillahi, we la dhuli fidin in Lahi. He says that the whole objective of the Quran, every single verse, every single surah, the whole purpose is to do one thing, and that is to call all of creation to the worship of Allah and then to, and for all of creation to enter into the religion of Allah. And he says this entails, right, um, 
too, that this entails other things. He said, المقصد, So this ultimate aim of the Qur'an, this highest aim, it entails two things that are necessary. And these two things, uh, these two things that uh, this highest aim of the Qur'an entails, right, all the Qur'an refer to and go back to. Right, he says, أَحَدُهُمَا One of the two is بَيَانُ الْعِبَادَةِ الَّتِي دُعِيَ الْخَلْقُ إِلَيْهَا The first uh, of, of, of these two uh, matters is that the Qur'an is to clarify the worship, right? بَيَانُ الْعِبَادَةِ Right, to which all of creation have been called towards. And the second, وَالْآخِرِ uh, ذِكْرُ uh, بَعَائِثِ is to mention and clarify all of the uh, motivations which will uh, encourage people to enter into the religion and enter into these acts of worship and to lead and drive them to these worship uh, to these worships and so he says here then he goes on and further divides them in his in his book on tafsir uh, that he has um, we also see um, even contemporary scholars, uh, sorry, uh, we also see scholars like Imam al-Ghazali, whose work we will focus on in this session. And he's, uh, and then uh, who talks about in his work, Jawahir al-Qur'an, the maqasid of the Qur'an. And then we'll all, you know, and other scholars such as uh, Majuddin al fayroz Zabadi, who was one of the great, um, you know, uh, he was author of this great dictionary, Qamus al Mahith, and other works on the Quran, Basahid al Tamiz. He also has a book on the aims and objectives of each surah of the Quran. Um, and then Ibn Ashur um, passes away in the 1970s, also a very uh, late scholar from Tunisia. He also is identified uh, and further this uh, discourse of the Muqasid of the Quran. But like I said here, in the interest of time, I wanted to cover Imam al Ghazali's. Um, I want to cover Imam Ghazali's uh, iteration of the Maqasid of the Qur'an, as he explains in his work, Jawahir al-Qur'an, um, which I highly recommend everyone to, to read into. Um, and so Imam Ghazali says the following, he says, وَأَقُولْ سِرُّ الْقُرْآنِ وَلُبَابُهُ وَالْأَصْفَى وَمَقْصِدُهُ الْأَقْصَى دَعْوَةُ الْعِبَادِ إِلَى الْجَبَّادِ الْأَعْلَى رَبَّ الْآخِرَةِ بِالْأُولَى وَخَالِقِ السَّمَوَاتِ الْعُلَى he says here very beautifully, right, that the aim, the innermost secret of the Quran and its pure essence and its ultimate aim is that it is an invitation for all humans to the indomitable conqueror, Al Jabbar Al A'la, Most High, Lord of the final abode and this life creator of the lofty heavens and the lower earths, and all what is between them and beneath the soil. So this is the essence of the Qur'an, is that it is an invitation to us all, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and earth. It's an invitation. And if we look at the Qur'an in this way, then we'll see the Qur'an is calling us to something higher. And what is it calling us to? So Imam Ghazali says, consequently, if this is the ultimate aim of the Qur'an, he says, This consequently, the, the surahs of the Qur'an, the chapters of the Qur'an, and all its verses can be classified in six categories. right? And he says three of them. So and there's two groups of three categories. And he says here is that the first group is composed of three categories, and they're considered the this first group are the they constitute the necessary fundamentals, the usul and muhimma, very important. While the second group is composed of also three categories, but these serve and complete the first of the three categories, you know. So they're in service of and subordinate to the first three categories. So there's two broad groups, three categories in each group. The second group is is serve and complete the first group. So the three fundamentals, let's look at the first uh, first group of these three uh, categories. He says here is that, uh, he says, أَمَّا ثَلَاثَةُ الْمُهِمَّةُ فَهِيَ تَعْرِيفُ الْمَدْعُوءِ إِلَيْهِ 
وتعريف الصراط المستقيم الذي يجب منازمته في السلوك في السلوك إليه وتعريف الحال عند الوصول إليه. So he says the first, which are uh, of, 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 uh, have have primacy and importance here. These are the three fundamentals. They're composed of three groups, and he says here is that um, the first of those uh, of those three are those chapters and verses of the Quran which disclose who we are being called to, namely Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ta'rif al ilayhi. So the Quran, many of the verses, and this is one of the most fundamental and most important, is that it's a book that makes Allah Subhanahu wa Taala known to us. Right. Many times we would try to philosophize about who God is and the nature of his knowledge and the uh, nature of his attributes, all of these things. And if you look, there's so much confusion and disagreement and there's no consensus right, amongst you know, many philosophers and poets about who God is. If there is, if, if there is even a God and after, if they do affirm that then there's just no agreement whatsoever. And they're kind of left in, you know, some sort of mass confusion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he's made himself known to us. And that's one of the fundamental, if not the most fundamental aim of the Quran is to make Allah ta'ala known to us. And who better than he himself through his own speech. So uh, the second, so this is the first category. The second category are those chapters and verses which disclose the straight path which is required to adhere to in order to arrive to Allah the Exalted. In other words, you know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, then the Qur'an now also tells us the path in which uh, uh, which we need to take and the nature of this path and what is that path in order to arrive and to, be, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to arrive to have knowledge, full knowledge of Him. And then the third category of verses uh, and surahs and verses of this first group are those chapters and verses which make known people's states when they arrive to Allah. So in other words, you know who Allah Ta'ala is, the Quran tells us who Allah is disclosing to us who Allah Ta'ala is, the path to, to Him, and then the states of people when they arrive to Allah, meaning either they're people who are uh, achieve felicity or they're people who are, Allah protect all of us, who are of the damned and wretchedness. They deal with reward and punishment, felicity and wretchedness. So this is the first group that we're talking about here of verses in the Quran that they can be categorized into. And these are the this first group, remember, is uh, of a higher priority, right, uh, than the second. And so the first group is comprised of three categories of, and the chapters of the Quran can be organized into those verses and uh, chapters and verses which make disclose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. Right, the ta'rif al they disclose who we're being called to, namely Allah Ta'ala. And the second category are those uh, verse, chapters and verses which disclose a straight path, the Sirat al Mustaqim, which we're required to adhere to in order to arrive to Allah. And then the third category are what's the state of people? What are their states, their ahwal, and their qualities, and uh, when they do arrive to Allah? So now we can get to the second group. And Imam al Ghazali says, the following. He says, so here Imam Ghazali says, now in the second group, and remember these support and uh, complete the first group, first category. These are those verses of the Quran, right, that describe uh, the qualities and states of those who love Allah the Exalted in the subtle and kind manner, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats those who love him. They also describe the states of those who deny and who do not take the path to Allah, the, the Exalted. Right, and as well as how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with people who deny and do not take the path and not So the Quran will tell us, right, what are those qualities and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with different groups of people, those who choose to take the path and those who choose to reject the path. 
The benefit of this category of verses lies in raising fear among the people and warning them to be more cautious in their life. The second category now are those chapters and verses which recount the arguments of those who deny the invitation and refute their arguments. So this category, he says, Imam Ghazali who says, so Allah Ta'ala will actually quote and transmit the statements and the arguments of those who deny God, who deny the path, who deny the Prophet right? And Allah Ta'ala will disclose their errors. And he will actually engage in arguments. This is a very interesting thing of the Qur'an. The Qur'an actually engages in arguments, right? of people who raise objections, right, to the Prophet ﷺ, to his claims, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the claims of the resurrection, to claims of the existence of paradise and hell and hellfire and that there is an afterlife and so on and so forth. Right? All these objections, the Quran actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will uh, communicate and tell us what their arguments are and then engage them and respond to them, which is very, very interesting as book of as a revealed book and the whole point of this is to show and to warn us right against their arguments and to also clarify and to give a, a firm account of what's true and, and uh, regarding the nature of these claims the third imam ghazali says the third and final category with alithuha ta'rifu imarat al-manazil al-tariq wa kayfiyati akhd al-zadi wal-uhbati wal istadad it's very beautiful now. The third have to do with these um, is that a lot the you have verses, the chat uh, surahs and verses of the Quran that make known to us and clarify to us and disclose to us how to cultivate and traverse the stations of the path. So we're, if we do inshallah, you know, if we're on this path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the straight path, what are what are we going to encounter on this path? How do we prepare for it? What are how do we traverse this path? What's the nature of this path? How to make provisions? What are the provisions right we need? And how should we be prepared for the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All of this, right, is in the Quran. And this is the beauty of Imam Ghazali's iteration of the Maqasid of the Quran is that he says, if you take these six categories, you can place any verse, any surah, uh, uh, any chapter into one of these six categories, and then you'll understand the purpose of these six categories because they all aim to the ultimate goal and ultimate uh, aim of the Qur'an, which is that it's a da'watul ibad ila al-jabad al-a'la, it's the invitation. Right for for humanity to the uh, to the invincible and Almighty God, and so here this is a very beautiful way of you know as we read the Quran, as we ponder the Quran this month and inshallah afterwards, right? We have to understand why is it Allah Taala revealed the Quran and Imam Ghazali has uh, through his own contemplation and his own openings that Allah has given to him has provided us with an iteration of that. And once we understand it's an invitation to Allah and uh, it, it, and also, uh, then we can understand further that these six categories of verses and chapters, we can understand what the purpose and the aim of these chapters are, right? And so he goes on and to explain each of these six in great detail in his book, Jawahir al-Quran. What I suggest is um, to purchase the book. It's published in Arabic. Um, there's many publications, uh, editions of this work in Arabic. Um, the Dottelman has edition I would probably recommend. Uh, the other ones have um, some issues in them. In terms of an English translation of this work, there are some English translations. However, um, I think the this work, as important as it is, um, deserves um, much more uh, service. And so I think uh, for those who are able translators, uh, they should perhaps take this on and uh, bring this to the English-speaking world. And so uh, we can benefit from uh, this book and it'll help us to better understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, so 
uh, with that, it is 5.35 or 5.34. Um, I did want to go into detail uh, about this, but perhaps we can do this uh, next session. And what I want to do, uh, inshallah, if Allah gives us um, life and he gives us uh, well-being and facilitates for us uh, in the future sessions uh, on Mondays, is to go uh, and to look at uh, hadith, the uh, sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu about select surahs and about uh, select verses of the Qur'an. And that'll give us, inshallah, more insights into um, these surahs and these ayats of, uh, of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to talk about the merits of these uh, particular verses and particular surahs. And inshallah, I think we can unpack also what uh, Imam Ghazali has uh, um, outline for us and what we kind of took today in an introductory manner. We can perhaps go uh, further and explore that in the next sessions, inshallah. Um, with that now, we will uh, dedicate this time to questions and answers. And um, there'll be questions, but inshallah, uh, I'll try my best to have answers. If I don't, uh, I'll try to find the answers for you uh, for the future sessions, inshallah. So here, the first question is, what features of the Qur'an? would you highlight as indicative of its divine origin? And would you unpack that um, a little? So this is a, it's a really wonderful question here. Um, and the ulama have devoted um, many, many uh, pages to explaining what's known as the Ijaz al-Qur'an, right? And uh, which is the to show that the Quran is uh, the Quran's inimitable nature, right? And there are many um, different ways of understanding the ajaz of the Quran, but the word ajaz is interesting because it comes from the word um, ajaz, right? And ajaz, which means to be incapable of doing something. And so ajaz, which means the inimitable nature of the Quran, is to do ithbatul ajaz, right? Or ithadul ajaz. And so the Quran's nature is to show that the uh, when we say the Quran is has ajaz, or we're, look, we're studying the ajaz of the Quran, we're looking at those aspects of the Quran that render it that render human beings unable to and incapable of producing um, a book or even uh, a surah, right, uh, of the Qur'an, as, as has been um, mentioned in the Qur'an itself. So when they're talking about the uh, ajaz of the Qur'an here, right, what the ulama are, uh, have identified in terms of the ajaz is, it's, it, it comes down to its, um, what's called as balago, or it's the rhetorical aspects of the Qur'an, right? And so uh, we're, we're really looking at those aspects of the Qur'an that are rhetorical in nature, and um, that's primary, right? And uh, and the, and, and, and um, also the ulama, it's not just the rhetorical or the the aspects of the Qur'an too, but there, there are other aspects with Qadr Iyad in his book, Shifa, um, outlines. And so there's many, you know, um, and, and some of the other aspects of ajaz of the Qur'an have to do with its um, statements about things that were not known at the time, things that were of the unseen and that later came to be known. All right, those have, those are very, um, very important here. So what the ulama say, al-ikhbar an al muqayyabat right? Al-ikhbar an al madi the Qur'an in forms of, of past nations that were known to the Arabs or the, uh, at that time or to anybody. And so there's many different aspects of the Qur'an that indicate as ajaz. And um, it de depends really on what aspect are you most interested in. But the first place I would recommend is to read in Qadr Iyad Shifa Bi Ta'rif Hukuk Al Mustafa. And he explains, uh, he goes into a fair amount of detail and outlines very nicely what the aspects of the Quran are that make it inimitable. And then from there, you can go further. And most of the um, 
scholars when they investigated this issue uh, of the ajaz of the Quran proving its divine origin, they went into the um, into the linguistic and rhetorical aspects of the Quran, and so it does require a deep knowledge of the Arabic language itself. Um, as you uh, continue and advance in your studies of this aspect of the uh, Quran, which um, indicates and establishes its divine origin. Um, now, I hope that answer for now uh, suffices, inshallah. Tamam, it is 5.40 at this time. And I would say... Uh, that um, what we can do are, uh, we're just, uh, oh, we are uh, getting some more questions uh, ready uh, to look into. Okay, so one, asp uh, one question here is, um, what are some practical approaches for contemporary Muslims to explore and understand the aims of the Quran? That's uh, a good question. What I would say is, uh, well, one is <laughs> to, uh, you know, when we're looking at the Quran um, and we're trying to determine our relationship to it, um, first of all, I would say that we should we should keep in our minds that although um, you know the Quran's in Arabic and we should be studying Arabic to the extent if we want to deepen our relationship with the Quran. Um, uh, I, I think that I would like to say that when you look at Muslim cultures, um, they did reflect on the meanings of the Quran and study the Quran without necessarily having to have mastered the Arabic language or even, you know. So you look at, you know, your, uh, there's average Muslims who don't know Arabic, but they read uh, and study the Quran in their own native language. And so... Um, for us as English speaking Muslims, right? Uh, and, and we should we should not be afraid or we should not have to wait to master the Arabic language or to gain even proficiency uh, when um, you know to to start studying the Quran and understanding the aims of the Quran. We should uh, you know we should um, allow for the English language to be, a, a language in which uh, the Quran's message can be communicated, and we can study the Quran uh, even, you know, using our native English language. And so, here you need to uh, acquire and be able to discern uh, some good translations, quality translations of the Quran. And you should always have a person uh, who does know Arabic and does have um, training. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when it comes to tafsir and um, you should, you know, uh, speak with and consult with and perhaps study under them in your communities. So getting a good translation of the Quran, starting to read that and, um, you know, as a group and then finding a person who does have um, the necessary qualifications uh, who you can consult, uh, even in the English language, I would highly encourage that. Right. And um, you're studying this book and this book is in Arabic. It doesn't mean that you can't appreciate the book and develop a relationship with it just because you haven't mastered the Arabic language. It takes years to master the language. And so that shouldn't bar us from developing our relationship with the Quran. And so we should definitely have that. We should have study groups. We should uh, identify uh, reliable translations of the Quran. Again, not all the Quran, not, not every translation, you know, um, is of the same quality. So we should develop some way to discern what uh, are signs of a good, uh, of, of a high quality translation of the Quran. And for that, we should be consulting with um, scholars, people who do have formal training on that. Um, and so at the same time, we should learn Arabic and continue to learn Arabic as best as we can. It's a very difficult language. It takes time. But with patience and commitment and consistency, one can make some headway. But while we're learning Arabic, we should still be trying to understand the Quran, uh, even from in our own native languages. And so that's 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 not a problem at all, inshallah. Um, please do ask questions, um, send them, and then we, even if we haven't answered the questions, we're able to, we'll, we'll, we'll save these questions for, um, 
or next time, um, inshallah. Um, and uh, and then we'll do that because it is close to uh, one minute left. And um, so what we'll do is we'll uh, basically take that question. Uh, so there's one last question maybe we could end with. This is what is better to do, to do tafakkur or tabdabar of the verses or just read the Quran and do a khatam? Um, it's a, I wouldn't say it's an either or. It's really, you can do both, right? You, you should be having the Quran, you should be reading the Quran uh, in order to do a, a khatam of the Quran. But at the same time, you can have a separate uh, reading parallel to the reading the Quran for a khatam in which you are studying its meanings, you're reading a tafsir, you know, you should have tafsir Jalalain, you know, with you. Uh, it's, it's a very famous tafsir in Arabic. Um, and or you can have a translation of the Quran that you're using um, as you're to understand the Quran, to do tafakkur and to dabbut. Um, so these are various, you know, it's not an either or, you should do both. You should do both. And um, they both have benefit and they both have, um, you know, uh, their own impact on developing your relationship uh, in the Quran. So uh, excellent questions, though. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll end there. Um, for this session, uh, we have a, you know, packed live program every day in Ramadan. It's 5 p.m. every day. On Mondays, you know, we're going to be going through the the objectives of the Quran. Uh, on Tuesdays, we have Dr. Salman Yunus, who will be going through the spiritual dimensions of fasting and charity in the Quran. On Wednesdays, we have Dr. Ramon Harvey, who's going to explore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beautiful names in the Quran. Friday, we have Dr. Rania Awad, who will, uh, who's going to focus on finding healing through the Quran. Saturday, we have Dr. Suleiman Van El, who will look at spiritual jurisprudence in the Quran. Sundays are uh, Dr. Abdullah Rothman's days, which are he'll be exploring knowledge of the self in the Quran. And of course, we have our dear and beloved Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad with Ramadan moments. Those aren't live but they'll be released on uh thursdays so it seems like you we have uh, if you just follow cmc you'll have quite a lot of uh you know uh things and programs to look forward to which is excellent people um, that focus all on the quran during this month which is where we should be focusing on the quran and uh, with that, you know, I will just remind ourselves that, you know, as an independent institution of higher education and registered charity, the growth and success of Cambridge Muslim College rely on the generosity of our friends, patrons and supporters from across the UK and beyond. So help Cambridge Muslim College train future generations of Muslim scholars, thinkers and leaders and continue delivering educational programs such as Ramadan Live. Again, you can help us continue our vital work through regular giving, become a friend or patron of the college today through one-off donations, whatever the amount, or you can also pay your zakat to the college directly, benefiting students in need. Again, visit us, please, Cambridge Muslim College at ac.uk uh, forward slash donate and donate today. Um, I'm really honored um, by your presence and your questions. Um, may Allah Ta'ala give you tawfiq and afia, and this month may he accept all of our works, all of our prayers. And um, I uh, hope to see you, uh, inshallah, um, in uh, next week. But please do uh, join in for the remaining uh, programs this entire week. Wallahu um, subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhum.